Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Today's topic is lessons learned on the journey through a website accessibility audit. And this is in partnership with our friends at NW Heat. My name is Megan Raymond, and I lead programs, events, membership, and sponsorship here at WCET. So it's great to see so many familiar names and some new names in the webcast today. As we're going through, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A. Sometimes they get put into chat and we lose track of those. So we wanna make sure that the questions go in the Q&A, but feel free to converse in the chat. The slides, the link to the slides should be in the chat and you can download those and follow along. And if you wanna participate in social, the hashtag is WCET webcast. The webcast is being recorded and we'll send a link out to the recording as well as any resources that were shared. Today's moderator is Marianne Colgrove. She's the deputy CIO at Reed College and she's the co-chair at NW Heat. So I'll let Marianne, Marianne come on and talk a little bit about NW Heat and the work that they do and she'll introduce the panelists. Welcome Marianne. Thank you, Megan, and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our webinar today. Uh, Northwest Heat is a collaboration between the Orbis Cascade Alliance of Academic Libraries and the Northwest Academic Computing Consortium. Uh, this is uh, IT folks in the um, greater Pacific Northwest. So our, our two organizations are collaborating on this uh, joint effort to support digital accessibility on our campuses. And we are especially working to uh, build community and information sharing amongst uh, library staff, IT folks, and others at our campuses who are striving to make all of our resources and services more accessible. We are doing this through a series of webinars, uh, generally four to six each year, uh, some in the spring and again in the fall. Um, and we're very excited to collaborate with WCET on this one. Um, there will be more information forthcoming. Our next webinar that we're hosting will be on May 18th, which is Global Accessibility Awareness Day. And we're going to have a series of lightning talks from some of our members. So if you would like to learn more about either uh, that event or other Northwest Heat activities, you can visit our website at nwheat.org and, uh, and learn more about what we're doing. So from there, I would like to um, just briefly introduce our speakers. They will uh, introduce themselves more fully. So um, we will have uh, in this order, Rosa Calabrese, John Northup, and Russ Poulin. So off you go. Thanks everyone. Thanks Marianne. Um, as she said, I'm Rosa Calabrese. I'm the manager of digital design with WCET. And I have been the, um, internal staff lead on our accessibility project, um, coordinating with the different appropriate parties. And my name is John Northup. I'm with an organization called WebAIM, which stands for Web Accessibility in Mind. And I'm one of those parties that Rose has been collaborating with. My team has been providing feedback on web accessibility for the WCET properties, web properties. And we provided a report that described some accessibility pitfalls and some recommended resolutions to those. Excellent. I'm Russ Poulin. I'm executive director of WCUT, the WICHE Cooperative for Educational Technologies. We are uh, part of WICHE, the Western Interstate Commission of Higher Education, and I'm a vice president for that organization as well. And Marianne, I'll just go ahead and go to the uh, opening part of it and we'll move on from here. Great. Great. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, for uh, for uh, hosting us today. And on behalf of WCT members, I, I really welcome 
uh, this partnership with our friends from uh, NWAC, the Northwest Academic Computing Consortium, uh, the Orbis Cascade uh, Alliance of Libraries, and uh, NW Heat. Uh, and if we explore that acronym soup too long, uh, we won't have time for anything else. And so we'll just say the thank yous and that there's lots of partnerships in all of this, and especially with WebAIM as well, that you'll hear more from them later. So WCT, the Wichita Cooperative for Educational Technologies, uh, we're a membership organization that's focused on uh, the effective use of digital technologies in teaching, learning, and student support. And while we're housed within Wichita, which is a regional organization, we have members that are mostly institutions from all 50 states and a few from Canada. And we have long championed the need to address accessibility needs in websites, educational technologies, courseware, library services, or, or any place where students could be inhibited by non-inclusive designs. A few years ago, we partnered with the Online Learning Consortium and with WebAIM for a year of accessibility. It went over so well that we had a second year of accessibility because there was a lot of interest in that. And a blog post from Cindy Rowland, that Cindy Rowland, who's the head of WebAIM wrote uh, about the most common items for which institutions are cited by OCR uh, for accessibility findings. Um, she did a review of those and it still remains uh, one of our most popular blog posts to this day. And then uh, talked to her recently and she said she still uses it uh, as a reference. And I put that into the, uh, into the chat as something that you can see where you're looking at what you're doing. But for today, what we're focused on is that recently, WCT conducted a complete overhaul of our website. We were very conscious about the design decisions that would have an impact on accessibility. But how good did we do? We decided to turn to our friends at WebAIM, who are experts in this field, to conduct an external independent accessibility review for us and to give us a true independent assessment. As you can imagine, that is a hold your breath and gulp sort of moment. Uh, and uh, what would they find? Uh, what would we have to do? Uh, uh, where did we fall short, you know, and where, where were we good? Well, we were pleased with the results um, and the cost of this process is really not that much. The review was amazingly extensive. Uh, we have been working on the recommendations ever since we received them. And while much has been done, there's still, still more to do. It, it, it does take a while to work through all of this. So a goal of today's webcast is to serve as an example of holding ourselves accountable in not only talking about accessibility, but in living that commitment through our services and our practices. Today, we wanted to share with you what WebAIM's process entails and our journey in improving our website. And we want to challenge others to conduct independent reviews of your own sites. This is truly a challenge. Get out there, we stuck our necks out, uh, uh, you can do it too. Also, as part of Wichi, we use their base web design format for our website. While we could make many decisions on our own, for some of the decisions and some of the updates that we had to do, we had to work in concert with those in charge of the Wichi website. We see similarities in what some of you are facing uh, in your institutions, while you may be a library, a college, or department, or some other unit that has to work within a larger institutional infrastructure don't let that deter you. Some of the findings that we did on our site ended up improving the, wor uh, the work of the workings of about a half a dozen sites within the Wichi family. And we could see similar things happening within the institution if you took a lead. We hope you enjoy hearing about this journey and become inspired to follow us in your own setting and do some independent analyses at your will. Thank you. And I believe John, I think you're next, is that right? Well, I think that sounds like a good handoff to me. And as Russ was talking about, this is a very intentional process, getting into accessibility. It doesn't just happen. It requires us as designers, developers, to step out of ourselves, to step out of our own browsing habits and conventions and put ourselves in the mind of other users. Now, this is what usability has been all about for years. But accessibility, I think of that as being kind of an extension of usability because users with disabilities are still users. So with that in mind, I think one takeaway from this process is that there's no single click answer to accessibility. I, I know I go around and, and I see ads for, well, just install this little widget and your accessibility problems will go away. And I 
it, as attractive as that sounds, if it sounds too good to be true, it really probably is. And something like that might solve a few problems for a few people, but to really be thorough about it and to really uh, catch all the different kind of use cases we need to think about, it really takes humans stepping through a website and replicating those various use cases of, say, a user who's blind and just hearing content in a screen reader, or a user who has vision but can't manipulate a mouse, and so everything has to be done through the keyboard. So, and there are other disability categories we test for as well, say, um, is a website usable by someone who's colorblind? Are we depending on color for anything? Uh, what about users with different kinds of cognitive and learning disabilities? Users who might be easily distracted by animation or something that's blinking. There are all these use cases that we consider as we step through a project. And it's just, it's just impossible to do that with one script. So that's what my team does. I have a team of three web accessibility specialists, and we go through very deliberately looking at every piece of a site, listening to every piece of the site in the screen reader and experiencing that content in the keyboard. And in the process of doing that, we'll describe the barriers that we find. We'll explain how they impact users. So instead of just saying, oh, this violates rule 1.3.1, we'll say, well, a user is gonna have difficulty accomplishing this task or a user can't submit that form or whatever it is. And then we'll make a recommendation for a strategy to resolve it, which might be a little snippet of code, or it might be, well, we suggest changing this to this, or maybe we'll just recommend this other structure, this design pattern that's been designed for accessibility. And we wind up with a multiple page report, it is, um, as Russ was uh, describing, and there are a bunch of recommendations in there. And on the receiving end of that, well, where do you even start? It can seem a little onerous, like you're coming into this story in the middle. So one thing we do to help with that is assign a severity level to every one of our observations and recommendations. We have a four point scale where we start with critical, where a user cannot do something. It's just, I, I, I can't get this content. I can't hear this content in a screen reader. Or if I'm on a keyboard, I can't tab to this. I can't open this. So that's a critical barrier. It's like a brick wall. One step down from that is what we call significant, which is, well, it's not technically impossible, but it's really, really cumbersome. And you really have to fish around a lot to figure out how to do this. One step down from that is a moderate barrier. And that's kind of everything else that, that, that would be required by the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, so there, there are things that can be accomplished, but with some inconvenience. And then down at the bottom, we have our fourth level, which is recommendations. And these are things that aren't really failures of the web content accessibility guidelines per se. But there are ways to smooth the path for users with different types of disabilities. Sometimes there'll be ways to make something more efficient or less redundant or just more obvious. So I like to think that that helps the reader, the team on the receiving end of this, decide, well, where do we start? Where do we go from there? Well, what are the most important things? And another way we organize these reports is we have some things that we notice are impacting multiple pages, like something in the global header or the global footer that would be on all pages. So we put those in their own section. And then we go down page by page within the scope of our evaluation and describe those barriers that are just appearing on one or two pages. And then we map all of our recommendations to the web content accessibility guidelines, kind of as a high level view to say, well, this guideline is supported or this guideline is partly supported, or this guideline is not supported, with just a couple explanations of why that's true. And then the detail of the report goes from there. So we try to serve a, a wide range of readers there from, from say someone at the, at the C level, uh, an executive level who just wants to know, well, how are things going there? To someone who's a developer and is going to be coding and implementing these changes. We like to have something for 
all of our readers there. Uh, I did see a couple questions come in, and I'm I'm out of pocket, so I'm going to have to fish around on my phone. Um, Russ, did you want me to take those now, or are we going to save them for later? Let's save those for a bit. I think Marianne will come back and ask you those. So. Okay. Great. Well, I can um, dig in describing the internal process. Um, so um, just to go over a little bit of what we experienced on our end. To start this project, we identified uh, several pages and then later on a couple PDFs um, to ask John at WebAIM to review. And as he said, and as Russ also mentioned, he provided us with this amazing document with so much information um, about all the different accessibility issues that could be posed by our site and their severity rating. And so from there, from having that document, we dug into who would handle what. And so WCET, I'm the primary uh, web person on our staff, but there are other people on our staff who handle different sections of the website. And then we have Witchy, our parent company, who Russ mentioned, they have a site that is very similar to ours, but there are some differences. And so there were some things that we handled just WCET, and there were other things that we handle collaboratively with Witchy. And then we also need to create workflows with our web developers. Web developers working just with WCET, our web developers working with WCET and Witchy together. And then all through this, I'm also communicating back with John when I have questions of, oh, we tried to solve this accessibility issue in this way, does this work? Or I have a question about how this works or how I should address it. Um, and he's been so helpful along the way, um, even when I feel like I'm not asking things in the most direct way, but he helps me. <laughs> um, and then uh, it was important to design workflows and communication methods. Um, I've been meeting every other week with our web developers. Um, Russ is in most of those meetings also. And then we share back with our staff. And then I have a separate every other week meeting with Witchy and our web developers. Um, and then a lot of email over Teams and email in between. And then finally, this is not something we've done yet, though I have talked to John about how we intend to do it, is to have certain pages re-reviewed to make sure that we did the things that we set out to do and that we properly fixed what we were trying to fix. Um, next slide. Um, so then this is just a few examples of some of the common issues that came up on our site. Of course, there were um, a variety of other things that didn't fall into these categories, um, but I thought that these were some interesting buckets to share. Um, the first one was keyboard access. Um, all, all parts of the website need to be accessible uh, by the keyboard, and uh, so there were certain things um, like the um, Cookie disclosure, it had, um, you couldn't reach it by the keyboard or um, if you open a pop-up window, you can close it again. Uh, and there were parts of our search feature that weren't accessible by the keyboard. And so those are things that we're working on fixing. Um, and everything that we talk about today, it's in progress. There are some of these things that are completely fixed and some things that aren't. So if you go to our website now, it'll be a work in progress. <laughs> um, Another thing is alternative text. This was an interesting thing for me um, because I, uh, I had always known that decorative images um, would be given like uh, two quotation marks to signify a null tag. Um, but uh, I didn't realize that WordPress automatically puts in a null tag if there's no uh, uh, text given. And so, when I was putting in two quotation marks, uh, the result would be four quotation marks because uh, WordPress was also adding two quotation marks. And so I had to um, redo many of our images. Um, so that was quite an interesting lessons learned to understand working with our system and working with accessibility. But aside from that, that media does need to have the appropriate alternative text and that uh, if there's like a image of text, which there shouldn't be, but if, uh, if there's a logo, then all the text that is in the logo needs to be repeated in the alternative text. Um, and another problem that we had was the 
redundant links uh, where we have multiple links to the same place in a row. And this, I think it is fixed on our test site, but not yet moved to live. So um, on our current site, um, our resource cards um, under the resources link, there are three, three different places you can click to get to the same spot. And so things like that, where it is just, um, I don't know, a little bit convoluted, you're say using a screen reader. Um, okay, and next slide. Um, and then this is just a final sort of visual example of some of the problems that we had on our site um, related to the CSS, which is cascading style sheets. It's the aesthetic interface of a website. Um, and so we had some problems with color contrast, making sure that the text appropriately contrasts with the background so it is easy to read even for people who have like, color blindness, as John mentioned. Um, and then also making sure that links are underlined so that it's they are visually apparent, not by color alone. Um, and so on the left-hand side, you can see what our website was. On the right-hand side, you can see what our website is now. Um, this first one, um, it's our hyper, it's a hyperlink that was on our homepage. Um, it didn't have an underline. We've changed it, so it does have an underline. The next one is a scroll feature. Um, and this one is still in progress. We've made it much darker, much easier to see, easier to interact with. I think that we'd like to get the current hover over where there's that white dot. I think we'd like to get that a little bit better, but it's much closer to what we want it to be. And then finally, this is um, this yellow button. It's the hover over. When we have an orange button, you hover over it and it becomes gold to show that it's highlighted. Um, but then when we had white text on the gold background, it's very hard to read and now we've changed it to black text. Um, it's much easier to read. Um, next slide. And then this is just an example of something that uh, WebAIM offers. It's a tool for their color contrast checker. Um, so this is fully something that I can do on my own. I don't need to keep asking John to <laughs> let me know. Um, so on the left-hand side, um, I was checking the color contrast of our old um, hyperlink that exists in our footer. Um, so the footer has this dark blue background. The hyperlink we were using was not um, enough contrast, so it's extremely hard to read. And you can see that it fails um, AA standards and AAA standards for normal text, and it only passes AA for large text. But it was small text, so. Um, we, and we try and hit WA standards, um, so it failed. And so now on the right, this is the color that we use now, and you can see that it passes um, the right contrast ratio. And then at the bottom here, I've linked to the color contrast checker from WebAIM, which is a great tool, a great tool for a digital designer to have. Um, next slide. Um, and then to wrap up, I wanted to give some lessons learned and some action items as well. Um, so a few lessons learned from the projects. I think that it's important to design workflows from the start of the project, which I mentioned at the beginning, but I also think it's important to not spend too much time trying to like outline what this will be. It's good for any project, but there were just so many um, like stakeholders in the project that I realized afterwards that I outlined for too long and too in depth. And then things have um, of course shifted over time. and. Um, so, so if I were to redo this project, I might change how some of this was done, including that I sent all of the tasks to our web developer in a table in a Word document, and that has <laughs> not been easy to keep working with over time because we've added so many new columns with notes. Um, it would have been better in Excel or in a um, task manager or something. Um, but I guess the important thing is to not overthink that beginning step. Um, another lesson learned is that we need to write down practices for the future because accessibility is not a one and done. It's a continuous process and we want to have these notes for the future so that we continue to keep our website accessible to the standards that we're making it to now and then we can add to it over time as well. And then finally, I think it was really important to us that we hire WebAIM, that we work with John. Um, it's hard for us to be able to identify every problem that could happen. Um, and especially for myself that I 
am in the website all the time and I know a lot of these things. I know about the color contrast, but I still missed a lot of the color contrast issues um, or in several places anyway. And um, it's easy to lose track of mistakes in your own work. And, uh, and then as John was mentioning earlier, there are so many varied disabilities and it is sometimes hard for me to imagine all of them. So it's great to have someone outside looking at it and helping us with that. Um, next slide. Um, and finally, these are just some quick action items um, for you to do now for your website. Um, check that the alt text is properly applied. Um, if you have decorative images, then use null tags, but make sure that you're not adding extra quotation marks. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and make sure that you write out the text of a logo if um, you have logos posted. Um, next, um, you can ensure that uh, color contrast is good. Visually, you can often see if it looks a little bit tricky to read and then um, put it into the color contrast checker just to confirm. Um, and then finally, I suggest navigating your website using the keyboard, try and tab through the different elements. Um, this is something that before this project I hadn't done very much and now I've done a lot more often. And there are certainly things that I'm like, oh yeah, I, I can't reach that feature, which John noted in our document, um, which I hadn't noticed before. And so we do need to find an alternative block to um, fill that function that can, that can be reached by keyboard. Um, and I hope that um, those are a good place to get started um, before you can, uh, do more substantial accessibility work in the future. And that is all. Great, thank you so much. And now we're ready for your, your questions. So continue to put those into the Q&A and I'll let Marianne do those, those questions that we already have in there. Um, so keep them coming. Thank you, everyone. Um, it looks like we have some questions here, mostly for John. Um, so one is, do you use multiple devices and platforms in testing? Sure, thanks, Marianne. Yes, we do. We test on a Mac environment and also on Windows. And also we replicate mobile environments. Now, that being said, most of what we're doing is inspecting HTML. So if it's the same HTML being delivered and it's pretty much just standard HTML elements, then we can, we can know a lot just from that code. When things get a little complicated, when there are widgets that have been custom coded, that's when it becomes a little more important to do the cross-platform testing. But if we're saying uh, kind of like Rosa was talking about uh, alternative text, if we look at the code and see there's this alternative text for this image, well, that's going to be exposed to all devices. So that's pretty cut and dry. Thank you. Um, an another question around testing has to do with um, how do you handle auditing course management systems? Well, everything boils down to HTML. So we just inspect that HTML and, and typically um, an LMS or a CMS is going to have some more interactivity within the page, like things expanding, collapsing, sliding open, sliding shut. There's gonna be an authoring tool in there and there's a whole other set of guidelines for making the authoring tool, like, like the CK editor, can it generate conformant accessible content? So that opens up a whole new door there. But um, so it's, it's kind of the same as other websites, just with some new directions. And uh, what algorithm is used to determine the contrast ratios for the WebAIM contrast checker? Okay, I wish I could recite all that. It, it, gets, <laughs> it, it gets very intricate, but it, the idea is it takes an RGB value and it weights the RG and B values. Because if we have, say, 100% green, that's going to have more luminance contrast. It's going to be brighter, say, on a gray scale than 100% blue or 100% red. 
So there is a formula that the W3C specified, the, the Web Accessibility Initiative within the W3C, that generates a contrast ratio. And so this is not something that we've invented. This is pretty well standard in the accessibility community. But the idea, again, is luminance contrast. And then there's also some weighting for the color red, because red tends to be more prominent. And actually, I'll tell you, I've tried to find the origin story of this, this uh, algorithm, and I haven't been able to come up with it. But um, that's, that's the idea of what it does. It, it tries to compare luminance contrast. Um, let's see, the, a follow-up to the question about how do you um, audit course management systems is um, whether you can do audits of courses and what kinds of samples materials would you want to look at? Well, it depends on if you're using something like Canvas, where we're just looking at SCORM content, the content that you create and not so much evaluating Canvas for itself or that other container. Um, then we just look at your content. We go through it with the different use cases like I've been talking about, say a user with a keyboard, a user on a screen reader. Often there are videos as part of this. And so we would look for captions there. Now, there are occasions when making course content like test content accessible could give away the answers in the code. So there are exceptions for those and there are recommend recommendations that we would make maybe for ways to restructure that testing content in a way that wouldn't be prone to giving away the answers. Thank you. Um, let's see, a couple of questions here. Uh, someone might have missed this at the beginning is, uh, does the audit just identify the issues or do you help with how to fix them? We identify the issues, we describe their impact on users and we make recommendations for how to fix them. And as Rosa was talking about too, we're also available after fixes have been made to go back and check again or get on a Zoom meeting and talk about it and clarify or give examples. So we're there throughout the whole process. It's not just like throw the report over the wall and go away. Yeah, but, and to follow up on that, there are a few things, um, I don't know, a, a few specific examples that I have. Um, one is that we have on our website, this kind of like, floating social media on the side of the page. Um, mm -hmm. And John uh, pointed out that it, it's not accessible um, using the keyboard. And so we've been working with our web developers and it's just like an out of the box block from WordPress and it does not have like good, like good ways to make it accessible. Um, and so we were talking about it internally and it is a useful tool to directly share this page onto social media. Um, especially on our blog, but it's not a good tool to use. And so we're in process with our web developers to find a different block that does have the capability to become um, accessible by the keyboard um, and then use that instead. Um, and then another thing that um, we've been, this has been a big thing that we've been talking about is um, it's like carousel images where they um, rotate through. And uh, so we use those on the top of our homepage. It rotates through images that advertise different events, different things that we've done. And then they're all clickable so that you can go find out more. We also use them at the bottom of our homepage for a scrolling uh, sponsorship list. Um, here are all of our sponsor logos. Um, and so because it is constantly moving, it, we need to have the ability to pause it. And so John gave us suggestions on how to pause it, how to stop it. Um, and then he also let us know that they're generally considered not very accessible. Um, and so then we've been working with our parent organization, Witchy, and they have been thinking, trying to decide if they wanna keep using a carousel feature at all. Um, it's very beneficial to us in many ways. And so we have been trying to figure out if there are ways to make it accessible enough or make it accessible and then, um, 
keep using it. And so I emailed John recently. I had so many questions about making carousels accessible and he just bulleted every single one. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Um, and I've sent it off to our web developers and they are working on making it accessible for us so that we can keep using those features. Um, so he provided so much information at the beginning and then has continued to provide so much information throughout. It's been great. <laughs> Fabulous. Oh, great. A uh, couple of questions uh, are kind of around best practices. Um, one has to do with the use of text styles like bold and italics. And um, they've read conflicting information about whether screen readers announce those styles. Generally not. Uh, screen reader users have a lot of personalization settings, verbosity settings, and other checkboxes to check and sliders to slide to tweak out their own experience. But generally, bold and italic is not going to be announced in a screen reader. The color of text won't be announced in a screen reader either. Thank you. And another one um, in a similar vein, but this has to do with uh, making alt fields for text images required. And they've had a debate in their office uh, about that, how do you go about weighing the relative harm done by having alt text on images that shouldn't have it versus not having alt text on images that should? Well, either one of those cases is a failure of the web content accessibility guidelines, which are the metrics that we follow. So having alternative text on something that doesn't need it is a failure. It, it takes a site out of conformance. And not having it on one that does is also a failure. So alternative text, it's not, I don't want to use the word easy with anything, but it's a little more straightforward, um, I think. I think the answer is educating your content creators so that they know the difference. I think if a content creator doesn't know what alternative text should be or how it's used, I think then they're more prone to make those mistakes. And we have an article, a free article just for everybody on alternative text that will step through some different use cases and some different examples of when it's needed and when it just gets in the way. Great. Uh, another best practices kind of question is, uh, any suggestions on the best LMS or websites to provide accessible math tests with MathML? Oh, gosh, I hesitate to recommend any particular one. Um, if there's one that you're thinking of using that you'd like us to dig into a little bit and give some opinions, feel free to reach out. Great. Um, now we have a couple of questions about um, process. And uh, so one is um, for the folks at WCET, now that you have feedback from WebAIM, how are you communicating the results to your teams? Have you adopted new process to, to support accessibility from the ground up for new content, which may extend beyond the web development team? Yeah, we're, well, for communication among staff, um, we have, regular team meetings and we share um, what's been going on with this project. But for ongoing, um, what we'll do in the future, we are kind of in the beginning stages of creating a document that will list how we need to produce things in the future. Um, because we're not done with the project yet, it's still in its infancy. Um, but things that are straightforward, um, reading order headlines, um, how to um, use certain styles that we have in control on our side, because some things are of course with our web developers and that'll be a different document just to record it and make sure that we stay in line with it. Um, but uh, structures that we control, those will be formed into a document. Oh, and um, al alternative text, that's a major one. Um, especially for things that we do describe and our standards for how we describe them. Um, that will go into a document that kind of lives in the, a similar place as um, our website style guides, our language guides, and things that we refer to regularly for how to put things out there. Um, 
And then, I mean, it's mostly a select few people who are always doing things on the web, but of course there are times when there are other staff who do it. So um, it is definitely something that we would share more broadly. And then, um, as I mentioned, we are still in the beginning phases of going through the um, document that John sent us about PDF accessibility in response to the two PDFs that we had him review for us. Um, and thing, something like that, where we control all aspects of it, unlike our website, which is more than half controlled by our web developers, um, that will definitely um, be uh, prominent in this document that we create, um, how to handle things in the future. Yeah, as Megan said, Rosie does a great job of keeping everybody up to date on things. And then uh, the one thing that uh, uh, Megan and Rose are working on too, I see PDFs is in there too, is that we've been working with the uh, communications team that people are creating any PDFs for us about what to do about uh, working on PDFs as well. Great. Um, let's see, what kinds of information uh, or tools were useful for the handoff and tracking between different phases like design, development, content, et cetera? Um, I think that, I, I, as I mentioned, I don't think that I chose the correct tools for this. Um, I used a Word document, a table in a Word document to keep track of things. And now at this point in the process, I think it would have been much better had I used Excel, which is still simple and a shared a shared Excel document. It's still simple. Um, we don't have to get into like task manager um, software, but it allows so that we can keep a column of text that is um, what John gave us from WebAIM, a column of text that has the severity rating, a column of text to say like who's assigned to it now, um, a column of text to say its current status, <laughs> who needs to approve it before it goes live, um, different things like that. And so we did that basically in a table uh, in Word with our web developers, but it's gotten to a point where we have so many different uh, columns, but some of them <laughs> don't make sense to be there anymore. We pass the time where they're relevant. We need to keep adding more. There's only a limited amount of space in Word. If we had done it in Excel, we could collapse things, um, remove lines. Um, I'm less comfortable with Excel, and so that's why I didn't start there. But um, knowing what I know now, it would have been good to be there from the start. Um, but there are also times when we've used Planner from um, Microsoft Office um, for different projects with our web developers, and that seems to work relatively well, too. It just would have been a very exhaustive effort at the beginning to go through and make them all, make sure that they had all the relevant content and linked back to the um, document from John. Um, so I think that it can get kind of tricky. There's just like so much information. Um, but I think that Excel would have been really good. Great. Okay. This is for both uh, WebAIM and WCET on the topic of inaccessible widgets and complex interactive elements. Are there any common or really popular trending things right now that you often have to warn people away from, especially in higher ed? Well, not to, not to pick on this group of carousels. <laughs> and we've talked about that. Uh, there, are, there are design patterns for conformant carousels, but the hazard with a carousel is there's animation that can be visually distracting. They do the keyboard user a lot to pass through, and it's kind of hard to explain to a screen reader user exactly what's going on. So even if something is conformant, it can still be a little inconvenient. And I can't answer to what's common. Um, I only know what I've seen doing websites at WCT. Um, but I think that Something that I've observed is um, in website trends, I guess, to try and have, um, I don't know, a lot of like visual features or interactivity um, just to, um, I don't know, spice things up. If like, if our content doesn't necessarily lend itself to having a lot of visuals, which is 
something that we work with a lot that, um, I mean, we don't have students. We talk to institutions who have students, but we don't have any. <laughs> um, and uh, we don't have classrooms. Like uh, images that universities might use don't always apply to us. Um, and I think that universities sometimes have trouble with their images too. Um, and so to spice things up, to break up the, I don't know, visual experience, then we put in things um, that are kind of uh, hover over and it has such and such functionality. Um, and realizing through the um, accessibility process here that a lot of those features are inaccessible. And so we need to have a different method of breaking up text. And of course, it's still good to break up a lot of text, um, even for accessibility, but not to rely so heavily on features that, I don't know, do something different when you hover over them or are frequently moving or anything like that. That's a, it's a process to learn. And uh, more around uh, imagery is during the review process, how did you handle graphs and charts? What changes did you have to make to infographics for them to be compliant? WCAG, AA, or AAA? That is something that we are still in very early phases of. And so I can't provide a good answer now, but we can get back to it, back to um, it. send a response later. Um, this is something that came up a lot with our PDF review, um, but I have not dug very far in. Most of our um, most of our graphs that we use are in PDFs. Uh, we don't have as many on our site. I don't think we, we had them reviewed anywhere else on our site, um, but I can follow up on that later when we've um, established more. Uh, but John, if you had anything to add about Sure, just, just in general, yeah, just kind of in general, when we have a, a bar chart or a pie chart or something that's conveying information visually, that could introduce some different barriers. I mean, there is the whole idea, well, do we just put alternative text on this and have every data point spelled out in alternative text? That can get to be some kind of long alternative text. And then stepping back, well, if we have all these slices on the pie chart and they're all different colors, well, then what about color blindness? What about someone who can't tell the difference as easily between those colors? So what we generally recommend is putting the data points into a table, good old fashioned data table. And that might be on the same page, say right below the graph. If it's really complicated, you might wanna put it on a different page so it doesn't intrude so much on layout, or you could put it in a disclosure, one of those show hide things. But that way, all of those data points will be accessible to just, just as wide a swath of users as possible. Screen reader users can interact with the table and hear that information. It doesn't rely on color. It doesn't rely on being able to understand the pie chart layout. It's very direct for a, a very wide group of users. Great, and um, this is another one about images. Uh, it, it's kind of long, and um, so I hope I will do it justice. This person is, um, their audience is cognitively and visually disabled adults. And their uh, website is now in the diner, designer developer handoff stage. There are many, many JPEG images um, with text in and upon the images. Fun. Um, so should there be, uh, they could create lengthy and complete alt text faithfully quoting every single word and character, but it seems nonsensical to the audience and they never read it. Um, given my very special and small audience who will not ever read the alt text, what is your recommendation? Should I strictly follow alt text rules, um, which in this case end up seeming kind of absurd or uh, or a briefer description? Well, it has to be equivalent. So if there's all that text in the image, then if we're relying on alt text to convey that information, it would have to be complete. And of course, I'm not looking at those images. I'm kind of imagining what's being described, but we would recommend if it's just an image of text with 
no really distinct style like like a logo or something like that we would recommend using real text instead of the image text and in fact that's one of the WCAG, one of the web content accessibility guidelines requirements is around images of text it says if essentially if you can achieve the same presentation with just true text then you have to use true text so beyond alternative text, some users need to zoom content and it'll reflow within the page. If you zoom in on an image, you know, it gets all fuzzy and JPEGy, and it might go off the side of the screen and you have to pan back and forth. So there are all kinds of costs with using images of text. Yes, great advice there. And also another uh, question about alt text. Can an alt text be used uh, for humanizing? Can you uh, represent the spirit of an image that is not related to the content? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I was having a hard time hearing it. Yeah, sorry. The uh, so this is about using alt text, uh, I think for a more um, kind of descriptive uh, in a more descriptive way, can alt text okay. be used for humanizing? Can you present the spirit of an added image that is not uh, related to the content? Well, I think I'd have to see that image first, but I understand sort of where, where we're going with this. Like, what if an image is more about than what it contains, what if it's conveying a, a feeling or, uh, as you say, a, a spirit or a mood or something? How do we convey that? One way to do that would be to use the text that's visible on the page around that image and then have some thinner alternative text on the image itself. There's an example that we use in training that shows seven students on a college campus and they're sitting in a circle on the grass under a tree talking or studying or something. And there's a lot there. There are trees, there are plates of grass, there are buildings, there are seven recognizable individuals. Well, what do we do? Do we name every tree? Do we count all the blades of grass? Do we tell what building that is in the background? Do we give all the names of all the students? And where we fall on that is, if that's important information, then make it visible in the accessible text that's around the image and have that image something like, oh, students studying under a tree. Now, every case is different. So if, if you want to send me that image and the page that it's on, I could give an opinion there and, and maybe provide some, some clear information. Great. Uh, and kind of related is, uh, do you have any strategies for convincing colleagues that there is such a thing as a decorative image? Many of my coworkers have a strong conviction that all images have a purpose and should be recreated in alt text. Well, there is a lot of subjectivity. There's subjectivity on the design side. There's subjectivity on the user side. We poll screen reader users about every 18 months for what they like and what they don't like and what kind of software and hardware they use. And They'll tell us different things. There's a certain camp that says, look, this, this is a lot to go through. Don't bother me with the touchy feely, fuzzy stuff. Just let me get in and get my job done and get out and onto the next thing I have to do today. But there's the other camp that tells us, well, look, if there's an image there, I want to know about it. Don't decide for me that I don't need to know that there's an image there. Don't go filtering my experience for me. So we try, to, we try to aim toward the middle for equivalence. Some images just are decorative. Like if there is a, a horizontal rule image or a little graphic goo-gaw to separate paragraphs, there's really no meaning there. And a screen reader user is going to hear a separation, a, a, a little pause between those paragraphs. So maybe what that visual separator is doing, the screen reader is going to do anyway. So again, I point everybody back to that article that we have on alternative text. And if there's a specific example you'd like me to look at, I'd be glad to follow up with you for even. Great. Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, um, 
what email outreach program does WCET use and can WebAIM analyze the content of uh, email outreach? Um, well, let's see, I've, Megan, in fact, might do a better job than me or Russ, you can jump in since you just unmuted. Yeah, the, we, we use predictive response for uh, mass marketing, and then we use something called Fire Logic for for communities. And, and and to be quite honest with you, that has not been part of what we've examined at this point. But it raises a real good question of of, uh, of, of looking at those, and uh, and we are looking at both of those in terms of um, well, especially with one of them that we're looking at changing them, and the idea of accessibility and how much accessibility is built into that structure is one of the big questions that we're asking of any new vendors that we're looking at. Um, it was not something we asked before and we should have, but it's something that we're looking at as we're looking to change these tools. John, do you want to take it from there? Sure. For the uh, web in component of that answer, yes, we can evaluate email templates as well. The, the concepts are the same. Some of the techniques are different because a lot of the HTML that we can use in a built web page just doesn't work in email yet. Okay, thank you. And I think we have time. Our last few questions are around resources for people who, uh, who want to do more. Um, do you have any design pattern libraries you can recommend as useful resources? Yes, there is. Uh, a collection of design patterns on the W3C site, the Web Accessibility Initiative. Um, I don't have the URL at hand. I can send that out, uh, maybe to be distributed to the group. I think we, I think if you Google W3C WAI APG, it will come up. So W3C WAI APG. And if that doesn't work and you'd like that link, reach out to me and I'll be glad to provide it. Great. And any suggestions for web development training or courses that prepare for accessibility testing? Um, their well, web developers that is the, trying to improve. I'm, I'm sorry, I cut you off there at the end. Oh, that's okay. I was just saying their, their web developers are looking for options to improve. Well, I have to say that when the award for the softball question of the day because um, <laughs> WebAIM offers training in just that. We have training in accessibility techniques where we talk about how to create accessible HTML. We also get a little bit into the laws. We talk about accessibility concepts, the different types of use cases to bear in mind, again, as well as the actual techniques. <laughs> and then stepping up one level kind of above that we have strategic consulting and strategic accessibility workshops where you're not just thinking about, oh, what should we put down on this line of code, but how do we bring the concept of accessibility into our organization? How do we make it of value from the top all the way through down to the individual contributors? And we go through different techniques, uh, different strategies, how to get everybody on board, how to make accessibility everybody's job, uh, advice on procurement. If you're bringing in that external widget, what do you ask those developers? How do you ensure that what they're providing you is going to be conformant and up to your accessibility? And all that's available on our website through the training link. And John, I, I put for asking. John, I put some links to to that uh, for you uh, into the chat for everyone. And also uh, oh, I gave so uh, thumbs up to the AHEAD organization that they do a really good job. Uh, their, their conference is pretty spectacular on this, that they do what they're doing other things through their webinars and stuff too, but that they're another one. Great. And one last question. We're going to make it, hooray. Um, if you... Uh, this is someone looking for suggestions of tools or strategies for fixing PDF files when you don't have a team of people to do it for faculty. Well, we have another training seminar, uh, I shouldn't say a seminar. This is an online training course in creating accessible PDFs. So instead of 
creating a PDF file and then saying, well, now how do we go back and fix it? This will show the participants how to use Microsoft Word and Excel and PowerPoint to create something with accessibility in mind and then do a little polishing in Acrobat Pro. So that could be a good place to start. Um, does that answer the need, answer the question? I hope so. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to need to wrap it up. And uh, mm -hmm. we are at the top of the hour, Marianne. Thank you so much. I'm just going to oh. zoom through these last couple of slides, but thank you for all of the wonderful questions. And Marianne, you did a great job managing those as they came in. So just a few last notes from WCET here. Members, we have a closer conversation coming up on April 28th. That's about how, what lessons we learned pre, during and post pandemic about improving access for all learners. And it is the deadline for submitting your proposal for WCET and ASWE, the Annual Summit for Women in E-Learning. So get your proposals in. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge our annual sponsors that underwrite much of our events and programs here at WCET and make our work happen, and our supporting members. Thank you all for attending, and keep an eye on your email for a link to shared resources. All those good links will be captured and shared in a document in the link to the recording. So thank you to our speakers, thank you to Marianne, and thank you to the audience. Have a great afternoon. Bye, all.